Hello and welcome to the Runners World podcast with me, Rick Pearson. Wow, and me, <laughs> Ben Hobson. It's been all about being surprised by your own name. Oh, well done. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's me and, and Ben. Um, today we're speaking with Sam Murphy about how to run your best marathon. I'm going to say, you know, legend. Legend of the marathon. Legend of the game. Yeah, true. A True. former col- columnist for the mag, yep. long term, like a 10 year stint. Yeah, you get, you get less for murder, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Uh, Sam's, Sam's an absolute knowledge. Uh, yep. So this is, this is a good one in terms of all of you out there who are taking on the marathon, be it brand new or experienced, but looking for a bit more mm. insight. Mm. This, is, this is for everyone. This isn't just like, oh, it's January. Let's try and get some beginners over the start yeah. line this is everything i was picking up new tips today and i was particularly like the base phase yeah absolutely base phase, and there's some surprising stuff in there isn't there that uh, i think that um base phase and mileage early doors yeah exactly exactly which was very interesting um in your marathon experience mm. which is vast vastly greater than mine uh what have you found that's worked for you training what, what was the sort of have you got any hot takes any life hacks when it oh comes nice to yeah so I I agree with Sam that putting too much emphasis on a long run that is increasing the whole time for me I think I've got quite a, a large injury risk particularly with like lots of yeah, yeah, yeah. longer running yeah so I did I did quite a lot of quality probably more quality than um, than a lot of people would do so and I think my longest run was probably only about might have been 18 miles and I might have done that twice but having said that, I was going into that marathon fit. So I was, so I was, I was starting that train block where I was like, yeah. I'd done quite a lot of cross country stuff. I'd got, I got close to three hours before, before kind of, for wanting to wanting to break three hours. Um, so it was kind, so I, I felt like I was just, I was getting closer, and I didn't need to pull out anything magical on the day. It was just kind of like, I'd done some hard racing, quite a lot of quality work, and. Mm. Um, so yeah, so I, so I think taking some of the emphasis off the long run and including maybe a bit more speed than some people might think isn't the worst way to approach it. And I think that part of this is all about anyone can do a marathon. That's that's a, a proven fact, I'd yeah. say, by yeah. just looking at you know the people who enter in the fields that yeah. complete it. Um, but I think from a performance point of view, it's all about discovering the method that works best for you. Definitely. And Definitely. and I think that that's what, you know, this method, but Sam talks through, might not actually work for a couple of people. Yeah, yeah, totally. But given, you know, some people might thrive just by gym work and lots of quality. Yeah. And yeah. they'll get around just doing it that way. But it, it's uh, it's definitely a really, a really interesting conversation we have her about a different approach. Yeah, I think so. And it's, be- and it's backed up by decades of experience and oh. science. We're not, and we're she's not- tried it. Sam's yeah, been yeah. through the, she's, you know, any methods of possible whatever you yeah, know yeah, approaches yeah, yeah. She's like, this is you know a few years ago she talks about this one being this way or this one being yeah, this yeah, way yeah it's 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 an assimilation of decades of yeah knowledge and stuff like that yeah so. i think i think it's, it's a really good it's a really good plan to be to be thinking about and it's all in her book isn't it um she's got a great book how to run your best marathon yeah um how is your own running going ben you've got a few races in the diary what's going on well, yeah, true. I do. I do have a race in the diary. Still, it's still in there. I haven't rubbed it out yet. <laughs> it's cold. I quite like running in the cold. Yeah, I don't mind either. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. No, well, that take that of one off. All the activities, all the sporting activities. Yeah, ours is the best when it comes to cold. Um, cold. Yeah, agreed. Apart from like snow sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of warming yourself up, I, yeah. was, I haven't got that much time for the "it's too cold to run" argument. If Ooh, I'm honest, like it. If I'm honest, when. And if do you wear leggings? I mean, I have worn them, but it's. I feel like you, I, you, you don't like go right. It's it's under five degrees. No, no, I no. I will now just wear. Work and leggings. that's just me. But like, I think there's a case of wearing them if you were like out on the trails. Do you know what mm. I mean? Kind of like exposed environments. Mm-hmm. Like might be out for hours, mm-hmm. um, but I wouldn't put them on for like you know the thirty minute easy run. But each to their own. I would. Yeah. Yeah, it's cold. Because <laughs> it's cold. It's cold. <laughs> um, uh, what about you? How's your running? Yeah, it's all right. I've signed up for the... Um, uh, so I'm doing the Canterbury 10 miler nice. this month. Mm-hmm. Um, and then doing the Orion 15. Yeah. A classic of the genre. It is a classic of the genre. So 15 miles of m- mud around Epping Forest. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I've been going for many years. And mm. 
kind of had my eye on it and thought, oh, that's a great race. That's a good old school race. I'd like to have a go at it. And um, uh, a mate of mine, Brendan, signed sign me up. So going to take part. Well, I mean, it's, it's my neck of the woods. Mate. I'll come either cheer you on or I could join you, I suppose. Yeah, either one. Either, either one. one. Um, right, should we get Sam on? Let's do it. Let's do it. Our guest this week is a hugely respected author and runner whose latest book, Run Your Best Marathon, looks at the art and science of mastering the 26.2 mile distance. Sam Murphy, welcome back to the Runs Well podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for, for, for coming back on. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's kind of marathon time, isn't it? A lot of people are thinking about that. They've probably signed up for a spring marathon, perhaps. Yes. You know, wisely, hopefully. Um, <laughs> and are maybe looking for some expert advice. We thought, who better than that will get you on to talk about... Um, marathon training because obviously it's, it's your latest book's all about that so could we start with um before you begin a marathon plan do you think that you should be able to tick off certain things from a fitness perspective i like do you think you should go into a marathon plan like having never run or would ideally you already be able to run a certain distance before entering a marathon plan in your opinion yeah, well, in in my opinion, I know it doesn't always make me very popular, <laughs> but I do think that um, it's important that you that you have got um, probably the the sort of half marathon distance under mm. your belt because there's a really good reason for that. If you haven't run more than sort of seven or eight miles, or or perhaps even less than that before, you're going to spend so much of that marathon build up, you know, gradually trying to add on one or two miles every week to get up to the point where you know, you're going to reach your longest ever distance that you've ever mm. run, you know, maybe it's 18 miles or 20 miles. And, and that's going to be maybe three weeks before you're going to run the longest race you've ever run in your life. And to, to sort of, you know, weigh everything up to that end, push every, uh, you know, challenge up to that sort of final point of the training yeah. just before the race just seems to be, you know, a recipe for disaster from my perspective. So I think it's really important that I'm not talking about having to, you know, run a fantastic half marathon, mm. but I think that for you to be able to go out and run 12, 13 miles um, and do so, whatever the pace is, but to do so sort of reasonably comfortably so you don't literally have to sort of take to your bed for three or four <laughs> days afterwards yeah. is a really good place to begin your marathon training. So you've already got a good base of endurance um, on which you're going to build in that first phase of tr phase of training. Mm. Uh, before we get into the base as well, I mean, I guess that sort of sense of fitness and that won't means that you'll probably enjoy it a bit more rather yeah. than. Um, and uh, I'm not sure, Sam, if you can tell us, but the people you coach, I mean, the the experience of a completely like zero to marathon versus like mildly experienced runner through to marathon is a is probably a much more enjoyable experience yeah and there's no need to rush the process I think there is you know it's great that so many people want to take on the marathon now but you know we shouldn't be elitist about it and think that other race distances mm. don't hold their own merits you know I think I was reading something by Steve Magnus um, who's one of my favorite coaches the other day who was saying you know, we shouldn't even sniff at the 5K. Yeah. You know, it's it takes a lot of, of good training and, uh, and focus to run a good 5K. And we shouldn't just always think that the bigger the distance, you know, the harder the challenge or the better the challenge or whatever. So, you know, taking time to build up to running a good half marathon is going to not only set you in really, really good stead for a good marathon, but it's also a good achievement in itself. And I think you'll go into the marathon training with a lot more confidence if you know that you have, you know, aced the half marathon. You've really, like, Rick's face lit up then. Rick, Rick's favourite, like, sort of <laughs> enters a room and asks a question standpoint is, what's harder, training for a, tra training to complete a marathon or to run your fastest 5K ever? Oh, it's definitely the latter. Sam will agree with me on that. Well, it's, that's obviously what you've, you've achieved recently. <laughs> no, 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 I, wish, I wish that, but um, I agree with you. I think we, we tend to um, over... Um, emphasize distance and think that distance is the thing that you've got to aim for is actually yeah. speed whatever speed means to, to, to you is actually just as hard and just as worthy um, but the base we, yes let's talk about the base yes. I thought you were going to do some, a little bass line no, then. no, no. okay we can put that in as the edit <laughs> um, we often hear about building a base so in terms of when you're talking about marathon training plans what does building a base what are some of the elements that that 
includes? So really the base is about volume. So um, it's about the amount of running that you're doing. So we're totally not interested in intensity at this point. We're just thinking about, you know, how many miles can we comfortably and sensibly include in the training week so obviously the best way to maximize that is to run those miles a really easy comfortable pace so you don't want to be challenging yourself in terms of uh, you know how hard the runs feel it's got to really be about trying to build the length of the runs but also the the, the, the number of runs so that you're kind of building up to um, your close to the maximum weekly distance that you're going to run throughout your marathon training. So this is a this is actually a, an approach that I only really took on probably over the last five years. You know, I sort of followed the the accepted wisdom of of you know building up to your longest run, say you know up to maybe four weeks before the mm. race. But but you know when I kind of came across this this other approach. It, it did really seem to make sense to me, the idea that, you know, why would you leave your longest runs at, at the sort of back end of the programme when you're going to be right on top of the race itself and to actually try to get to the point where you're going to be able to reach that distance much sooner in the plan. So you've already ticked off, you know, an 18 or a 20 mile run much earlier in the game and you can then back off from that focus on some other things, come back, revisit that long distance again, maybe add a little bit more on, back off again, you know, focus on on some lactate threshold and some other types of training, and then come back and hit that again. So you are going to hit it a number of times throughout the overall marathon programme, but it's not about doing, you know, 16 and 18 and 20 and Mm. then 21 and, you know, week after week of these like ever building runs, which is much more likely to leave you, you know, fatigued, but also is going to increase your risk of injury. Mm. So keeping that that sort of initial build up to the base phase of the programme, so you're, you are building distance, but you're not also throwing in intensity as mm. well. It's very interesting, like actually. That. Yeah, me too, because I think that that's probably a, a large part of what people find daunting about a marathon plan is that they look to the, like weeks if you're doing a 12 week 16 week plan they look to week 10 or whatever and they go oh god i've got to run as you say 18 miles 21 miles or these these big long sundays yeah, and that yeah. accumulative effect is quite like oh i've got this is going to be exhausting whereas if you remove all that pressure and just sort of like as you say i mean it, it's still fairly daunting early doors in a plan to have distance mm. but to but to absolutely like it's not yeah. about any other work it's not about intensity this is purely a, a mileage kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. thing it really I remember like, yeah exactly and it does it does sort of tie in with that first point about whether you need to be at a certain stage before you take on a plan and you know I've I in my book I have gone down that road of saying you know I know you might want to throw the book across the room but I want you to be able to do 12 or 13 mm. miles and not just have done it once so you can tick tick the box but to be comfortable running that distance before you start so then when you get to, say, 16 miles, three or four weeks in, you can do it. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to feel effortless no. or easy, but you can do it. So then when you've got to, you know, 18 or 20 miles, you don't have to just, you know, keep on building. Or, oh, you know, the race is in three weeks time. You can take some time away from that, focus on some of the other aspects of fitness that we need to work on to run a good marathon and then keep coming back to that longer distance so you're not going to lose the fitness that you've gained from doing those longer runs but you're also not just going to pound and in, into it every single week and need to keep on going up and up and up and I think that's the thing that you know people are often so fixated on their long run and you know they, they kind of come to a training session in the week and they're sort of limping or oh I can't really run any speed tonight because <laughs> yeah. this is hurting and I've got to do my 20 mile run on Sunday yeah. and you're like well if it's hurting now yeah. you know you really don't want to be yeah, thinking yeah. about doing your 20 mile run and but it's such a sort of sacred thing to get all of those long runs and not miss any any of them and I think people really do believe that if they miss a long run you know that it's going to cause a massive you know, impact on their overall training program. And the truth is, you know, we're all going to miss runs through a build up to marathon. It's just, that's just the way life is. And, and, you know, we're not elite athletes living the life of, you know, with a a whole team of support people coming to feed us and massage us. There's no no midday napping, is (laughs) there? 
No. One of the, one of the surprising elements I think for people, and I think you subscribe to this, and I, I believe this is a Steve Magnus thing as well, but it's it's talking about a speed base. Sam, can you talk about that? Because I think for some people, the idea of a speed base will be new or seem a little bit counterintuitive, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I'm really, I I really was excited by the idea of the speed base. So just as, you know, the base training is, is, you know, traditionally we're thinking about, you know, running very sort of slow and easy and that we're we're, we're building, you know, like the base of a pyramid, really. And then on top of that, we'll build more intense runs um, which will be shorter and we're getting more intense and shorter as you go up the, the in intensity sort of scale. So the speed base is really kind of working almost the other way around. So when we're looking at doing kind of VO2 max training, um, you know, the typical sort of track intervals or, or, or um, you know, two, two minute intervals that we might be running, um, you know, at VO2 max pace going for, you know, real sort of near maximal effort. Um, that we're, we're, we're sort of going into that without really having any, any sort of having touched on any pure speed. So where we're really, really focusing on um, those type two muscle fibres, which are your real sort of um, anaerobic sprint fibres, really. Right. Um, and so the, the great thing about combining the speed base with the endurance base is that although the effort is very, very high, I mean, it's about maximal effort really to do to do eight, 10 second sprinting, but it's not really very exhausting on the body because it's so short. Mm. Um, you might've noticed that, you know, when you, you, you sprint sort of for 10 seconds and you don't have that same sort of breathing that you would have if you just run a 5K um, because it's working a totally different energy system. Yeah. Um, and so why would you do that? Well, using those the, the, the muscle fibers that are engaged when you're doing maximal work is really like kind of recruiting a team of temps who you might not need now, but there's going to be times during your running where you are going to need those temps to come in from the agency and help you out because <laughs> you're a bit overworked in the in the type one endurance fibers department. So you're like, okay, we need to call in the temp team. And the temp team have already done some training. So they're kind of ready to come in. And and this this muscle, this fiber cycling, you know, when one muscle fiber's tired, that another one can come in and take over. This really comes into its own during very prolonged exercise like marathon running. So you're in a way you're building your team mm. Um, to call upon when times get hard, and you're also going to be able to use those those um, sprint um, those sort of sprint qualities that you've built up in in other little aspects, like trying to surge past somebody, mm. maybe if it's on a narrow course, or get to the, the last ten yards, the finish line just before that <laughs> clock turns to a different yeah. time. You know, um, so we can combine the speed base by doing very very small amounts of very very high intensity work which are not going to fatigue your body in the same way that you would be fatiguing your body if you were doing more traditional yeah. sort of longer duration speed work. I like that. It's good, isn't it? It's a hack. It's a little bit of a hack. It's kind of the same. And also it reminded me, Sam, actually of a, of a podcast that we did a while back, which was talking about the benefits of doing some sprinting for things like bone density. Mm. Yeah, and absolutely. Things like that. And it, you know, so uh, there's one yeah. for people to listen back to if they haven't to. But it was, you know, you're you're, you're not just benefiting your your marathon performance here. You're doing some some good for the for the bones as well and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. Yeah, and I think it also just adds something. It's variety. Mm. You know, when you're doing those like long, um, you know, easy runs. You know, it's not challenging in terms of pace. But to 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 have a session where you're doing those little hill sprints, or they they gradually progress to flat sprints. It, it, it's just a totally different challenge and that's quite mentally refreshing as well as as physically refreshing and and really valuable and the sprint that's the sprint sort of brings us nicely into strength strength work because there's a bit yeah. of obviously with some hill sprints very hard efforts you can kind of replicate a bit of strength work with those sorts of things but there obviously would need to be i mean some sort of gym based perhaps strength conditioning work like that where does that fit in with you and your idea of sort of per running your best marathon yeah I think um strength work is really important for you know every level of of marathon runner you know it's it's a it's a injury prevention is probably the mm. biggest reason but also per performance improvement I think starting with the injury prevention side of things so for people who don't do any strength work at all um, I would keep the first, while you're doing the, the base phase, 
I would keep it to quite um, a sort of low intensity strength training. So in the book, I've got a, a kind of foundation program. So it's really just about um, using your own body weight to improve core stability um, and balance and, and just sort of general strength and mobility. So it's quite a, a, a sort of generalized and a simple program to follow. Um, but if somebody's already doing strength training, then they, they don't need to sort of go back to that, that they'll already be more accustomed and so they can um, include some um, strength training. So, yeah, I'm not really a big fan of the kind of, oh, I'm going to be using my legs over and over again, so I'm going to do hundreds of reps with a really low mm. weight. I mean, that, the, the science doesn't really support that as being the most beneficial way to strength train, even um, for marathon runners. Uh, so we're really looking at, at doing, I suppose it's quite the traditional format of strength training, you know, two or three sets of, um, you know, somewhere between eight and 12 mm. reps so that when you're getting to those last couple of reps, that it feels really, really difficult, but you can get to that, that sort of level. Um, and then resting between sets, you might want to go and do another exercise to be more time productive rather than just sitting and yeah, waiting your, for the time phone, to pass yeah, before yeah. you get on to the next one. <laughs> Um, so I, I really recommend doing strength training. Um, I, I've included some plyometric exercises. So plyometrics, um, for anyone who doesn't know, you know, that, that we're making use of the stretch shortening cycle. So that sort of, um, elastic energy that comes from the tendons lengthening. Um, and that's been shown to be really beneficial mm. to running performance, but again, it is quite high, um, uh, it's quite a high intensity, quite demanding type of training. So I would keep the that t to a, a time when you're, you know, when you're a little bit more accustomed to strength training. I wouldn't go straight into doing that, recommending mm, that yeah. um, in the sort of early days. Particularly, you could, I think the good way to think about it, I don't know if we're going to talk about uh, sort of kind of slightly external factors like nutrition and recovery and stuff. I don't know if we'll have time to talk about those today. But I do sometimes talk about this stress pot. You know, you've got a pot and the stresses that go in that include, you know, your life stress. Mm. So it might be, you know, your job. It might be, you know, sort of commuting, getting around. It might be family stresses. Um, and then your training is also a stress. You know, even though you might enjoy it some of the time, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is still a stress on the body. And so as you've added this stress of training, you've got to kind of think about what, you know, what else, you know, something's got to give at some point. So unless you're going to be able to up the other side of the, of the weighing scales, if you like, you know, and actually work harder on your nutrition, on your recovery practices, on getting enough sleep and all those sorts of things, then you're going to have to think, well, what stress can mm. I not add? Because I'm going to have to have this training stress at the moment. So it gives you a, a good way of thinking about what, you know, what to add and what not to add. So, you know, you might think, well, this is, you know, I'm doing this training, I'm doing a bit of strength and conditioning, and I've heard that the plyometrics is really great. Maybe I should start doing that as well. Well, just think about whether this is the right time to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, you mean it's, it's almost an endless amount of stuff that you, in the perfect world, you could do. If we, if we looked at, like, the next phase, which I think we're going to call the development phase. So we've done, we've done some base work. The development phase... We're looking to build both endurance and speed, I guess. What what role would something like lactate threshold running? Can you give us a definition of what that is and why lots of people, I think yourself included, think that that's particularly relevant to marathon training? Yeah, yeah. So lactate threshold, um, well, the lactate threshold itself is the point where your muscles are not able to clear the lactate that naturally accumulates as as, uh, as you work at an increasing hard intensity of exercise so your body is always producing lactate like all the time even as we sit here now we're producing lactate mm -hmm. but it's just cleared away you know it's a very sort of um relaxed process and then as you get to higher intensities of exercise that lactate starts to collect in in, in the muscles more and at some point you'll get to, you'll, you'll you'll reach a point where the the little people with the brooms aren't clearing it out <laughs> fast enough from the muscles I, I do like to have these little visualizations it's, it's, yeah, of all really these people doing these little jobs around around my body um and so it starts to collect and that creates a very acidic environment um which hampers the way muscles function um and that's that's what 
creates those feelings of um, you know, sometimes you get a, a kind of um, a very breathlessness, mm. a sort of extreme breathlessness where you might hear a little bit of a, I'm going to do an example now. <laughs> This sort of, kind of, you know, like slightly a tuneful yeah. note in the in the breathing, um, and you can also feel it in the muscles themselves. So it could feel that they've just gone to jelly, or sometimes it can be the opposite and feel that they've turned almost to concrete. You know, it's really really hard to keep moving them at, at, at the same rhythm as you were before. So that's the lactate threshold. And so what the research has shown is that if we can train at a point that's just below that level, that that helps to nudge the threshold upwards. And that's why it's the most useful form of training for any race that's sort of 30 minutes upwards. Mm. It's, it's one of the most useful um, types of training that we can do. So typically that will be um, a pace that is sort of around 10 K pace. I mean, one of the definitions people use is that it should be a pace that you could maintain for about an hour in race conditions. Right, okay. So if, you're, if your 10K is nearer to sort of 40, 45 minutes, then it's going to be a little bit slower than your usual 10K mm. pace. But if your 10K is, is closer to the hour, then it will probably be around the same okay. yeah. as your 10K yeah. pace. So, um, but another good way of thinking about it is just uh, is um, that it's it's comfortably hard. So, you know, you're going to be able to do it for for an hour. Mm. It's many people do their lactate training just far, far too fast. Right. You know, think, could I maintain this for an hour in, you know, it, with the adrenaline of a race and with a bit of focus? And so it should feel hard, but it's comfortably hard. It's not out of control, ragged breathing and all those kinds of things. Right, that's good. That's really how it should feel when you're when you're running so this is part of a sort of key metric for the development phase this is where we've taken what would you say the the base phase sam what do you think like time is there a specific time for that or is it just more how long you've do you mean got a, fra- a, t- a time frame for the length yeah of it? kind of is it is it do you yeah. need to is there a, is there a very a, a real quantifier or a, a, or a, you know where you can go actually the base phase is definitely done for me like i can i've done my distance and i've and i've reached that target or is it sort of just a you know a feeling well, inside I, yeah I mean, <laughs> a warm sensation yeah, like, it's not it's not always an ideal world is it um i think you, you you need to leave sort of six to eight weeks for your base phase but you know if you think if you work backwards from the date of your mm. race and you think well i've got i don't know 12 weeks until the race well you're not going to be able to give eight weeks to the base phase because you haven't got time to do that and still allow other things in there so you might have to sort of shorten that a little bit but so in the programs in my book the first timers always get eight weeks for the base phase just to spread out that build up of those long runs a little bit more and the experienced runners get six weeks Um, but I think that's you know, another thing I talk about a lot is about bringing yourself into the equation in the book. You know, this idea that you can't just kind of go and pluck a sub-330 programme off the shelf yeah. and then expect if you follow it, everything's going to just turn out at 329. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it, it just that, that's just not how it works because you have to think about what you're bringing to it, your experience, your previous um, experience of marathons, your fitness level, your injury propensity, how much time you've got to train, mm. uh, what your you know your mental focus is like. All of those things are going to uh, are going to kind of come into that. And you might be somebody who responds to training very quickly, um, sees improvements very quickly. You might be someone who takes a bit longer. And and so the more you get to know about yourself as a runner, mm. the more you can put that information into your into adapting any plan to better suit your own personal and unique needs. Yeah, that's great. Mm. And then so when the base is finished, we're into this development phase, lactate threshold, we've wor- we're working out what's what's hard now in terms of like, yes. like what's, what the, the sort of metabolic and uh, I guess anaerobic changes that need to be made by the, the body in terms of more effort and and how that yeah. gets yeah well we're still we're still aerobic right. we're still aerobic in 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 lactate threshold um i mean all the training that we're doing we're still going to stay aerobic apart from that stuff in in the develop uh, in the uh, base phase when we're doing that 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 maximal sort of sprint work and we do revisit that a little bit just to kind of um you know keep keep the hand mm. in really just uh keep those muscle fibers 
um, responses. Keep the temp, temp yeah. workers going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep on a retainer. Nice. So I'm aware that we've, we've also got a part two. Yeah, this is a two-parter. Of, of, a two-parter. So we'll have to leave people on a great kind of cliffhanger, Ben. What? Uh, what? Tune in for the next episode to find out about, about your de- development phase. To and find out exactly what time you'll run a, for a marathon yeah, to, to, the, to the very second. What's the final phase? It's the specific phase, Ben. Right, so we're going to do... So episode two is uh, more development, specifics. Exactly. And then we can talk maybe about the recovery that Sam mentioned as well. Exactly. There's so much. There's so much. Don't miss it. Oh my god! Next week, episode two. I'm excited. Okay. Ooh. So we've left it on a cliffhanger. What Huge happens in the de- developmental phase that's coming up? Oh, and the specific phase. Oh my god! You're going to have to listen next week, everyone. This is what we do now. We're just masters of suspense. That's it. Who did it? Was it the pacemaker? <laughs> Um, yeah, so we've got the uh, you've got Sam back next week to talk about yeah this the sort of second half of marathon training. So if you like this one, tune in next week. And uh, thanks very much for listening. You can subscribe to Three Issues of Runners World for just five pounds. Go to runnersworld.com slash uk slash podcast offer to get this exclusive listener offer. Uh, it's a brand new year, twenty twenty four people. Why not get a whole year's subscription to Runners World? I think that sounds like a great way to start your year and maybe a mate's subscribe for a mate it's not that much money just get them the magazine too and you can have like a magazine club and you all sit around together and read it like a book club but just for magazine just for just for runners world magazine so it's actually a fantastic franchise we should get onto that tell the people to do that uh thank you for listening uh you'll hear from us next week which will be the second part of this episode so it's actually really really good idea all right bye